church. We're the Girardi family. We are tuning in from Lindenwood and we miss seeing you at church every Sunday. But uh, we are also enjoying the opportunity to be worshiping together as a family at home. And yeah, so we're excited to dig into the Word of God with you today. Let's learn how to be set, set apart, apart together. together. My name is Richard, and I am privileged to serve as an elder here at Grant. I too would want to welcome each of you who are here in the sanctuary and to all of those who are joining us online. We're glad we can worship together. Now this is Thanksgiving Sunday, and I would encourage everyone to take some time this weekend to thank God for his blessings. I know we should be doing this every day, but let's this weekend make a special effort of thanksgiving, and then take a few moments also to express your thanks to others as well, for we appreciate what others do for us. Sometimes in these COVID days, it may seem to be easier to complain than to thank, but Think of all the material blessings we do enjoy, and then think of all the spiritual blessings we have in Christ. And always remember 1 Thessalonians 5.18, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Choices. Life is a series of choices, some trivial, others of eternal consequence, and of course, everything in between. When our family will sit down for a holiday meal, at the end of the main course, my wife will usually stand up and say this. Now, I have three kinds of pie for dessert. Apple, Saskatoon, and pumpkin, and she will go around and choices will be made, and some of the family will simply say, yes, please. And of course, each of those will then be served three slivers of pie, though they hope they will not be too slivery, if there is such a word. They're looking for a little something more substantial. And another choice regarding choice, or a statement regarding choices, Yogi Berra stated in his philosophical way, when you come to a fork in the road, take it. Now, that was something for you to think about, but that's a typical Yogi Berra statement. Choices. How will we respond to the choices given to us in the Bible lesson before us today. And I invite you to turn in your Bibles to 1 John as we continue the series that we have begun a few weeks ago. 1 John is near the end of the Bible. The Revelation is the last book, and then there's Jude, 3 John, 2 John, 1 John. So right near the end of the Bible. In chapter 2 and verse 7, follow as I read. Dear friends, I am not writing you a new command, but an old one, which you have had since the beginning. This old command is the message you have heard. Yet I am writing you a new command. Its truth is seen in him and in you, because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining." Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates a brother or sister is still in the darkness. Anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light, and there is nothing in them to make them stumble. But anyone who hates a brother or sister is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. They do not know where they are going because the darkness has blinded them. I am writing to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. 
I am writing to you fathers because you know him who is from the beginning. I am writing to you young men because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, dear children, because you know the father. I write to you fathers because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you young men because you are strong and the word of God lives in you and you have overcome the evil one. Do not love the world or anything in the world. For anyone, if anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the, eye, of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. Heavenly Father, this is your word. You have given it to us for our instruction, our challenge, our rebuke, our learning. Apply your truth to us. Help us to understand and then obey. In Jesus' name, amen. Now the opening verses of our text speak of an old and a new command. Note that these verses are directed to dear friends, or maybe more accurately, brothers. John is addressing Christians, his fellow followers of Jesus. Now, what is this command that he speaks of? The context would quickly direct us to the words of Jesus in John 13, 34. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. In what sense, then, is loving one another, as our text speaks of, a commandment? Looking at the Greek helps to answer this question. The Greeks had two different words for new. The first one means new in time. The second one means uh, new in quality. For example, you would use the first new to describe a recent model of a car or a supposedly new hit on the recording chart of the, of the music industry. But if you heard a kind of music or song that was so revolutionary that it was radically different, you would use the second word, new in quality or character. And the DJ playing that song would introduce the artist as having a new sound. Now, the commandment to love one another is not new in time, but is surely new in character. Because of Jesus Christ, the old commandment to love one another has taken on new meaning. It was new music to the ears of those who had been in bondage to the law or someone's philosophy of life. It was new in quality and character of love. Now, in the Old Testament, there was a similar command in Leviticus 19.18. Love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. And as in all parts of the Old Testament, the, uh, there was a penalty for disobedience. So we may say old as from ancient times or old in the sense that this command has been given a number of, uh, of years or had been given a number of years previously by Jesus and was now in John's time being renewed. Love for God and love for others motivates a person to obey God's commandments without even thinking about them. As one commentator said, when a person acts out of Christian love, he obeys God and serves others, not because of fear, not because of, of the law, but because of love. That is why John says love one another is a new commandment. It is new in emphasis. It is not simply one of the Old Testament commandments. No, it now stands at the top of the list. And obedience to this command was not only a matter of old and new. 
as our text said, it was also evidence of walking in the light or walking in darkness. The Christian who loves his fellow believers is living or walking in the light. He who hates his brother is walking or living in darkness. So this is serious stuff. Take, for example, as we add to this, 1 John 3, verse 14. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love our brothers. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Wow. Loving one another is an indication of our spiritual status. Now, the true mark of a believer is that you love your fellow believers. John 13, 35, and we all know this verse. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. John, in essence, is saying that you can tell those who are in fellowship with God, they walk in the light and they love. He also is letting us know that you can tell those who are not in fellowship with God, they walk in darkness and hatred. Now, the word love used here is agapao, or as we usually say it, agape. What does that mean? Well, the word, uh, the word be is a, a word that has a sense of selflessness. It is a love that is self-sacrificing. It is a love that is supremely interested in the, in the uh, one loved and for the benefit of the one loved. It is the kind of love that God demonstrated when he gave his son Jesus Christ to die for the sins of the world. You know John 3.16. God so loved, there's that word, the same word that is used in our text for loving one another. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. It was a, an act of love by the Father that he sent the Son to be our Savior. Now, the world also recognizes that love is a good thing. Consider the pop song by Hal David with music by Bert Rack, Bacharach written in 1965. Now, don't worry, I'm not going to sing it. I'll just quote it. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. It's the only thing that there's just too little of. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. No, not just for some, but for everyone. Now, if the world recognizes the need for love, how much more should the followers of Jesus Christ practice Christian love? Now, sometimes some of us have trouble loving our fellow believers. Now, if all our fellow believers were as lovable as we are, if they all thought as we do, if they all agreed with us, well, there wouldn't be any problem. Well, sure, I could love that bunch. And some, at least in our opinion, are just plain ornery and difficult. And so we kind of wonder, can, can, can I really love those? Should I really love those? Well, listen to what John 8, 12 says. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And remember, those who are walking in the light are loving. So if we are having problems loving, maybe we need to take a careful look at our relationship with the Lord. Are we really in love with Jesus? The more we love God, the easier it will be to love our fellow believers. Selfishness is too often in the forefront, and then love is a challenge because, you see, selfishness is the opposite of love. Failure to love our brothers hinders our spiritual growth, our spiritual progress. A blind man, a person who is walking in darkness, can never find his way, says our text. 
The only atmosphere that is conducive to spiritual growth is the atmosphere of spiritual light. It's the atmosphere of love. Just as the fruits and flowers that we grow in our gardens need sunshine, so people need love, agape love, if they are going to grow. Someone has well said, it is dangerous to walk in the darkness when stumbling blocks are in the way. An unloving brother stumbles himself and he also causes others to stumble. Failure to love our brothers is a stumbling block to others, especially to those who are considering the claims of Christ. It is bad enough when an, unbelieving brother, an unloving believer hurts himself by walking in the darkness. But when he starts to hurt others, the situation is far more serious. And Jesus said in his teaching that if we hinder others, it is a very serious matter. Our failure to love our brothers is too often used as an excuse by non-Christians to reject Jesus, and would you want that on your record when you stand before the Lord, that some turned away because of my failure to love others? Now let's consider two verses that will help us get the right perspective and will motivate us to obedience. We've already read them, but I read them together this time. John 13, 34, 35. A new command I give you, love one another, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Note, first of all, there's a command. Love one another. Sometimes I find that a strange thing. Why would, if love is such a good thing, why would it have to be commanded? Well, I'm sure you recognize the reason Jesus had to command it was because he knows our sinful hearts and our old nature is totally given to selfishness, not to love. So he says, you as believers claim God's provision and love one another. Then there is a standard that's given here. Note that it's not love one another according to what your uh, definition is. No, it's not what I think loving others is or what you think it is. It's what, how Jesus did it. He says, as I have loved you. That's the standard. That's the definition. And then there is, of course, the evidence. When we love one another, others will recognize that we are disciples, that we are followers of Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus' love to us gives us the model for how we are to love one another. We just noted that. The love Jesus has for us is not defined by rules or regulations. His love is defined by a relationship. Jesus came into relationship with me. The new commandment to love others is that our love is also defined by a relationship. I cannot properly fulfill that command given to us here until I know Jesus. So first of all, I need to have received Jesus as my Lord and Savior, that he has forgiven my sins and made me his child. And then I need to grow in relationship with him so that I may love others by his grace. So there's a choice. Obey and walk in the light or disobey and walk in darkness. And each has consequences. Now, often when we use that word consequences, we think only negatively. But that's a wrong use of the word. The word may have good consequences for good choices and bad consequences for bad choices. So, one or the other is a choice. But we move along. After commanding, or commending rather, his readers in verses 12 to 14, John introduces another contrast in verses 15 to 17. It is one or the other, love for the world or love for God. Now, the temptation is often to try and straddle the fence. Satan tries to make it seem possible to have one foot in the world 
and one foot on the Lord's side. He works hard on, on accomplishing that. Satan tells us that this is possible and even desirable. Now, here is a little principle that we can use in a lot of cases. In this case, as in many others, we must remember that Satan is a liar and the father of lies. John 8, 44. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. So when Satan tells you, oh, you can kind of straddle the fence, one foot on one side, one on the other, and, and you can, you know, don't get overdone on one way or the other and this kind of thing. He's a liar. Whenever Satan speaks to you, whether he speaks to, to you in your heart or whether he speaks to you through others or what have you, Satan is a liar, and we need to respond accordingly. James, uh, the apostle, says it in another way. He says, you adulterous people. Well, that's strong language. Don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred towards God? Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes the enemy of God. So it's one or the other. You don't straddle, you cannot straddle the fence. Now the world spoken of here is the cosmos, that's the word. The world system, the world without God, the world of time. And the grammatical construction reads, stop loving the world. In other words, John is saying to the people that he's writing to, you are loving the world. Now stop it, is what he is saying. Now the world is appealing to the old nature in us. Hebrews 11.25 makes that statement concerning Moses when it says, Moses chose to be ill-treated along with the people of God rather than to Enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. There is pleasure, especially for the old nature. But note the time reference. It's limited. And so the world system is transitory. It will not ultimately satisfy a person who has an eternal perspective. John makes it even more specific, starting in verse 16, when he speaks of the cravings of sinful man, or as we often refer to it, the lust of the flesh. In 1 Peter 4, 3 and 5, Peter gives us a sense of the lust of the flesh when he says, for you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans chose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. They think it's strange that you do not plunge with them into the same flood of dissipation, and they heap abuse on you. But they will have to give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. Lust of the flesh seeks to find fulfillment and purpose in that which can never give real and lasting fulfillment and purpose. Then it speaks of the lust of his eyes. It isn't talking primarily about the lust caused by sensuality, but rather it is talking about being distracted or captivated by outward appearances without looking at the real value. It's seeing the shiny bauble without recognizing that there's really nothing to it. Genesis 3, 6. When Eve saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. The woman saw and did not think through the consequences of the disobedience. And that led to the fall. Lust of the eyes. And then... There is the pride of life, the boasting of what he has and does. It is an attitude of arrogance 
which is based on the false confidence that comes because of my wealth or my achievements or my status in society. Effectively, the pride of life causes us to turn towards God and say, I don't need you, and I am certainly not dependent on you. Wow. Now, we would not likely out, burst out and say that, but sometimes that is the actual response of our hearts, the pride of life. Now, we must not put our security in these things like that are temporary, but the pride of life makes us put our security here, and it is a false security. All right, we have a choice, a choice to love one another or not, a choice to be a friend of the world or a friend of God. How do we deal with this challenge? Well, I start with Romans 12, verse 3. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but rather think of yourself with, here it is, sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. In other words, think this through carefully. Don't just casually look at it or assume stuff. Think carefully. So then, how shall we do this? Discern the issue. Recognize what the scripture is talking about. Recognize there is a conflict with the old nature and the new nature. Claim God's help. Secondly, ask God to help you see the eternal perspective. It is so easy to see only things for the moment, things of time, instead of recognizing the things of eternity. Thirdly, pursue spiritual disciplines that will draw you closer to God. For instance, Bible study and prayer and fellowship with other believers. And often at this point, I find a Christian saying, ah, come on, haven't you got something new? I, I, I'm used to all this old stuff. No, this old stuff is what produces results. Study of the word, spending time in prayer, interacting with our fellow believers. And maybe, though I'm calling it number four, it really is uh, more of the third one, don't neglect the fellowship and support of fellow believers. You are not in this alone. As you are in the fellowship of believers, you can encourage and, and support and help your fellow believers, and they can in turn minister to you as we stand up against these challenges and these choices that are before us. And then obey God. Whatever he speaks to you about, do it. Don't just think about it. Don't say, well, I've got to discuss this and see what else I can figure out on this. No. When God says do it, then do it. And it will be a, a marvelous thing in, the pro in your progress as a spiritual person, and it will be helping you make the right choices. Submit yourself to God. You see, we have made a number of statements uh, here now. We have listed them. But they are not really separate items. They are really all more or less operative at the same time. So we say submit to God. Yield to him. He is able to help you. Let me just remind you of some verses that, uh, that teach that. 2 Timothy 1.12. That is why I am suffering as I am, says Paul. Yet I am not ashamed because I know whom I have believed and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him for that day. He is able. Hebrews 2.18. Speaking of Jesus, it says, because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. 
What a blessed promise and assurance that is. And then Hebrews 7, 25. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. He always lives to pray for you and for me. A man by the name of Harry Lowe's wrote the following hymn in the early 1900s. And again, I'm not going to sing it. Don't worry. Friends all around me are trying to find what the heart yearns for by sin undermined. I have the secret. I know where it is found. Only true pleasures in Jesus abound. And then the chorus of that song, all that I want is in Jesus. He satisfies Joy he supplies. Life would be worthless without him. All things in Jesus I find. A choice. Love the world or love God. And again, each has consequences. I'm told that officers of the law, when they study counterfeit money, they spend relatively little time studying the counterfeit bills. They focus their attention on the genuine bills, the real ones. Thus, when a bill does not look or feel like the real thing, they know it is counterfeit because they have focused on the real thing. Likewise, in our Christian lives, Focus on Jesus. Yes, we need to be aware of the world. We need to be aware that there is a challenge and a, and a, and a, a choice to be made. But focus on Jesus, and then whatever arises, we, we judge it or, or take the standard of Jesus and assess whether this is helpful or whether this is not. Focus on Jesus. So, do our lives... Our relationships, our values, and our perspective give clear evidence of our love for Jesus? If not, then I urge you to confess your sin and claim his grace for you to move forward. And many of you, I know, truly do love Jesus. And I urge you to press on. Press on loving, serving honoring the Lord and blessing others. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a God of love and mercy and great grace. Thank you, Lord, that you have made provision for us that even in our weakness, we can find victory because our victory is in Christ. So, Lord, apply your word to our hearts and help us as we go through the days that are before us, trusting you, loving you, serving you. In Jesus' name, amen.